Morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this session on optimizing teams for cognitive load. My name's Stefan. I'm going to be speaking very, very briefly. I'm not the talent on the call. Um, I'm just here to introduce. Ben can also see the slides. Fantastic. Um, so, yes, uh, my name's Stefan. I'm a consultant. I've worked in a number of large uh, modernization and transformation programs, so I know just how important it is to for leaders to enable their teams to deal with the large cognitive load um the number of things uh in their working memory every day from the tasks they're doing the environment they're working in things in the big wide world and more besides and this session is all about helping you to help your teams to make sense of that world and to do so in a structured and orderly fashion um, and we've got Ben and Billy who will be talking through this for us. Both have got lots of expertise. So for, for now, that is me. Over to Ben and Billy. Oh, so uh, hi, uh, I'm Billy Thompson. Uh, you may remember me from such talks as uh, the FFC uh, talk on the con uh, cognitive load. Uh, and I'm most famous for doing a uh, making a readme template, weirdly enough. Um, and I still sometimes get nice little comments on it and stuff, which brightens up my day. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ben Dodd. I am uh, best known for helping large, complex organizations adopt team topologies in this way of thinking. Um, I'm also a published author. I don't know if you know this, Billy. Um, but if we round up the fact that my liver had its own photograph and article in The Lancet, <laughs> I'm claiming I'm a published author, right? That's a that's a fair claim to me. That's it's well cool. cool. Oh, I'll watch out for the next uh, serialization by your liver. Um, <laughs> hey, so uh, maybe some of you who are at FSC conference are getting a little bit of deja vu right now. Uh, maybe, like, so one of the things that we heard from the uh, FSC talk is that people were really looking for a more uh, practical way to apply this. They were looking for tools, they were looking for things. So what we thought we would do is we thought we'd come together and, and, and give you one. Uh, so what we're going to do today is we're going to give you a uh, quick overview for those who weren't over the talk. It's going to be super quick uh, of cognitive load and the different constituent parts. And then we're going to launch into how to do a, uh, how to run a workshop on uh, those things with you for yourself or for your team. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how these are going to fit into an overall structure about uh, cognitive load. So wh why, why are we talking about this? Well, the reason that we're talking about this specific thing, or at least the reason why I'm talking about this, is I have a bit of a problem. And I feel a bit bad admitting this, but like I suffer from burnout quite badly. And, and this is pretty common among non-neurotypical people. Um, and I find that looking at things through the lens of cognitive load and thinking about the different things that we're going to be talking about today uh, really helps me manage that. And it prevents me from burning out when I'm working on really cool projects with clients. Um and whilst Billy's got her, her experience of this, I think I've got a very similar set of experiences around burnout too. I think also to a certain extent, it's an every problem. It's an everyone problem. Um, there is the studies and statistics that are saying, you know, this quite alarmingly high figure of 62% of people who are saying that they are often or extremely often uh, burnt out. Obviously, this talk is about being burnt out. It's also be about being bogged down. So lots of the things that we are talking about in this webinar are really also talking about just being bogged down in terms of teams can't deliver. They can't get work out the door. Businesses and customers are being asked to do things and they just can't react. They want to put their foot down and respond. And when they do, they just can't. So we're equally interested in the fast flow of that sort of thing, but also um, the 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 burnout of our people and of our teams and of our organizations as a whole. And um, it's just, there's also a sense that it's getting worse. We are recovering from the pandemic. We are getting used to new ways of working. People have just gotten used to remote first. Maybe they're being asked to move back to the office and they're unpicking a life that they just built where they got to see their families every day and suddenly their community again. So um, the complexities of of the, the climate around us, the economy, the shifts in how we're working are all maybe contributing to making this worse too. 
So luckily, Team Topologies to the answer. Team Topologies <laughs> um, is a great book um, with some really interesting thinking about how we should just review the, our businesses, our organizations, our leaders and our teams through a different set of prisms and prisms which are based on how can we enable people to achieve fast flow and how can we manage their cognitive load so businesses and individuals are having a better time of, of doing what they want to do. And obviously you should keep the guarantee that came with the book that all of this is going to work 100% exactly uh, for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to take these things, we're going to apply the lens of cognitive load to them, and we're going to use that to uh, you <laughs> as leaders, as people who are going to be working in teams, as uh, individual contributors, we're going to try and use the lens of cognitive load, the one that I find so effective, to frame our thinking about what sort of work we're taking on. Um, so... So what I... is cognitive load? Cognitive load is the total amount of mental effort used in the working memory. So it's our capacity to um, do work, what everything that we need to think about to do the work, to deliver the work, to um, think about what the work should have been in the first place. Um, and interestingly, Billy and I, it turns out through doing this talk, have got a shared um, love of watching root course analysis films for why planes crash. Um, and it turns out that um, team cognitive load, um, which is the adding together of all the individual capacities of the people um, in a team, is equally important when it comes to getting these large metal tubes of people and uh, flammable fuel back on the ground. Um, so this is our key focus for this talk. We're thinking uh, really about the team cognitive load in a team first approach. Yeah. So how do you understand cognitive load? What are the constituent parts? Well, uh, thankfully, we have constructed a device which will uh, a uh, which will tell you all about cognitive load. Unfortunately, it's only a rhetorical device, um, which is less than ideal for uh, making this simple. But uh, we'll do our best. So, uh, essentially, cognitive load is made up of three parts: the intrinsic, the extraneous, and the germane. So, Ben, uh, what is Eight times by 17 plus 14. 150. Sharp, quickest attack. I hadn't even thought about it. Amazing. It's like, I can't believe you got that right, Ben. It's almost <laughs> like we planned this. Uh, so uh, the, the complexity of the specific problem is uh, intrinsic. That, the, how hard the thing actually is for you, that's the intrinsic cognitive load. So like from within a team, what it feels like is that like uh, as an individual and as a team, I'm not going to talk about all of these uh, if you want to see more detail on that, go back, uh, have a look at the uh, other talk. But um, if you like, we have to understand that there are some examples of things that people will experience in teams. So if an individual comes to you and says, oh, I don't know this tool, or if as a team you see that the work doesn't ever quite work right, then you're looking at things which are a problem with intrinsic cognitive load. Okay, next up, we've got intrinsic. So next up, we have the extraneous. Now, extraneous is all about like the complexity of the, the environment. Ben, is there anything that you could think of that might be a good example for what makes this like complicated? Maybe something immediate. Oh, um, that would be delivering a interactive webinar thing to lots of people <laughs> on the internet uh, <laughs> using a new set of tools. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So like... From the inside, like extraneous is, is like going to be like, oh, this sucks. Uh, loads of time, or but from the outside, it might look like there's loads of time waiting around for other teams. Um, and this one done? No, you go for it. Cool. Okay. So, uh, germain is the area of special attention. So, when I say this, like it is, for example, creating a like a, a, making the webinar compelling, make it seem like there's good chemistry between us, having good interactions and thing, making it interesting and engaging. In a work context, the germain is going to be is going to vary depending on your specific role, but it's it's the bits of the job which are particularly important. It's the the problems that you really need to be focusing on solving. Um, and like for an individual, this is going to look at the the like. Oh, can you just look at, let's run an experiment, do the why. Like for a team, it's going to be like just sort of agreements. It's going to be for a leader, it's going to be detangling uh, complex value streams. Yeah. What happens when you start hitting the limits, Ben? Um, so 
obviously the, there's a part of this talk which is thinking about burnout. So when we're starting to hit the limits of our cognitive um, abilities, both as individuals and as teams, um, then we're thinking about burnout. We're just thinking about overload and those sorts of things. But we're also thinking about how do we balance these different types of cognitive load? Because quite often when we are hitting the limits, we are going beyond our limits and we have completely removed Jermaine as the really the most important area of focus um, in terms of optimizing these three areas, just being not present at all. So people are entirely consumed with either being burnt out and the impact that that has or just doing their basic job and interacting with their environment around them. They are no longer thinking, what is the core business value I'm trying to deliver? What does the customer really want? They're just too busy fighting between the code and the pipelines and delivering and whatever it might be. Um, so we, we're thinking about those two different things. A, we're trying to avoid the burnout. And then B, we're trying to re-optimize these so that we can make space for Jermaine. Yeah, and like this is where you start getting that bo whole bogged down appearance when you have when you're loading up the team with work, they have no time for the domain. So it starts looking like there's lots of work being done, but nothing being produced. So not only is it bad for cognitive load, but you also get bogged down quite badly. Yeah, that's great. Um, and this is a real one of the real um, powerful. Uh, mental models for me when you're thinking about cognitive load is that we get to meet Lee, Minnie and Max. And Lee, Minnie and Max are um, the saviors of you and your organization. Um, we are seeing a lot of C-suites having special hutches installed in their boardrooms to be constantly reminded that Lee, Minnie and Max exist and are really important. Um, but what we're saying here is that if we can understand the difference between the different types of cognitive load, if we can categorize the tasks that we are doing against those three areas, then there is a different type of mitigation or optimization for each of them. It's no longer a case that you will just blindly apply um, simplification to everything that you are doing. What you want to be thinking is, how can I um, target the, uh, the interventions based on what the type of task is? So we are hoping to simplify the intrinsic. So this is uh, Lee. We're going to minimize the extraneous and we want to maximize the domain. So this is a hopefully a little way for you to remember that these things exist and these are the types of things that you should be thinking about depending on the type of cognitive load. I've said type of cognitive load more than I think I ever want to in my life. Yeah, so. Uh, so what I'm trying to get to here is that like, we can't be Taylorists. A tailor, tailorism is the idea of scientific management, that a person can be reduced to a single action, a single optimum movement for a specific thing. It is the idea that you could start a stopwatch and stop a stopwatch and have the perfect like recording of a thing. But that's that's just not true, because what people bring to a job is someone who can learn, who can change, who can grow. Uh, and uh, if we try and pigeonhole people into these boxes, then we need to make sure that uh, we can, like, it's going to feel like an attack if they come up with a suggestion. Whereas if we put in place a system which looks at the cognitive load of a team and grows and changes based on their current context, then we are no longer like pigeonholing people. We're taking a space for people to learn, for people to grow within the teams. And if that's not a compelling reason for you, like uh, I want you to listen to this advice I read on the back of a bit of card in an airplane, um, uh, which is put on your own mask before helping others. So these tools can help you manage your own cognitive load. So even if you don't think that that's super important to think about how organizations work, you can use these to manage your own cognitive load and find more time for the things that you personally find valuable. And I don't think many people want to be firefighters. I mean, like, I must admit the Halligan is pretty cool, which is a special sort of crowbar. Really big fan of that. Go look it up later. I recommend reading the history of it. Um, but uh, yeah, like, I, I think people need the space. You want, you want to be able to find the space, to find the time, to be able to focus on the things that are really important for your organization. Okay, right. So that's the review of cognitive load done with. Okay, so I'm going to just limber up a little bit, warm up a little bit. So my first tip 
for uh, running this as a running a cognitive load workshop with your team is to make sure that you warm up. Now, uh, uh, like a really, really good thing that I think you should do right away uh, when you join a meeting, it doesn't really work when you've got about 150 people in the room. Uh, but like, uh, say you've got a your more normal pizza sized team, get everyone to speak in the first five minutes. Get everyone to speak in the first five minutes and say something meaningful beyond hello. That will drive a lot of engagement. So what we're going to do is what I recommend as a way to, to, to help with that is to start framing some of the things that we're going to be talking about. So I want you to imagine you're a chef. <laughs> There's a joke here about me swearing all the time that I'm not going to do. <laughs> Channeling gone, Ramsey. Uh, but uh, so... Um, but I, I want you to think about like what might involve uh, it, it, what might your team might actually be doing when you uh, when they think about this. So what I want you to do is I want you to get your team to go through and find a really obvious example. I really like the chef because it's like the canonical one. Um, however, so and then just get them to drag each of these little sections down to the appropriate area, and you can even like guide them as much as you like. The point here is to get them to think about what is extraneous, get them to think about what is germane, and maybe do some actions around it. So you're starting to frame the exercise so that within the first few seconds, you can have everyone in the room talk, uh, that you can have people starting to think about what is the correct way of like using these terms. So for a chef, the intrinsic, a really good example of this is like how hard the meal is to cook. So in the task, this might come up that you spend a load of time just thinking about how to do the problem, how hard it is to program in C sharp, uh, how difficult it is to identify a customer who's going to be a safe pair of hands to try out some new thing. Uh, so it might be how many courses there are in a exercise. Uh, it, for the extraneous, um, you might have a really pushy mouse who's somehow sitting in your hair and, and telling you what to do. Um, uh, and that might be extraneous. So that would be the sort of, uh, that would be an example of that for a chef. Another example is like, well, again, this is all about the environment. So it is about disorganized ingredients. It's about it being a really complicated to check out a, uh, uh, a specific cutting board, for example. Uh, and for a chef, the germane is all about the things which are going to add brand new, new value and be exciting. So we have the trying a new fusion cuisine, maybe developing a new culinary technique that is going to really put your restaurant on the map. Uh, the idea of this is not for it to be complicated, but for it to frame what's going to come next. Okay, so uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to push the button. I'm going to go off 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 the thing and going to start dragging around. Okay. So next up, we have this little exercise. Uh, and what I want you to do as the start off to this exercise is I want you to start thinking about what the ideal is for your role. Now, for a chef, that's probably going to be to like make awesome food and make hungry customers like really happy and have a have a great time. Um, and the point of this here is not to like be super specific. It is about to capture the primary purpose of your role to frame the rest of your thinking in that context, because we tend to go back to the things that we've most recently thought about because they're easier to remember. Okay, so next up, we have uh, the breaking down of the tasks. So uh, like, and I've just taken the tasks from the previous exercise here. Uh, so like it might be it might be cooking a really tricky meal. It might be preparing 17 courses. Uh, it might be searching for dissolve, uh, disorganized ingredients. It might be, I don't know, maybe you always need to feed the, the mouse that drives you around the kitchen a little bit of cheese every time. Uh, maybe you need to uh, like work on those new culinary techniques they've been around. Maybe like the thing that always gets pushed down the backlog is the is your fusion cuisine thing, but you really need to try and do that. So the things that I want you to think about here are making these tasks like specific, making these things include the learning tasks that you think are valuable and are important to your role. And like really get into this. So and then once you've gotten these tasks and you've identified them, you can split them into smaller categories. So you can start breaking them down and sorting them into the intrinsic. Now, what we found when we do this is that some of the most valuable conversations happen in this sorting, particularly in a group of people. 
So as you're pulling out your uh, like tasks and your activities into these separate categories, I want you to be listening to the conversations that are happening at the same time. Like, what is core to your vision? Are there any alignment issues here between like what you are attempting to achieve as an organization and what the team believes is the most uh, like is the germane and is the extraneous? So like this is an opportunity to identify mismatches in vision, but also to start like uh, preparing ourselves to try and follow the advice of our, our, our three fantastic furry friends. Okay, so so once you've written, once you've come up with like the um, uh, once you've come up with sorted these out into different categories, what I want you to do is I want you to come up with the ideas which are going to like identify. So a chef, this might be like go on to the decorative vegetable course to make it super easy to make florets. Uh, it might be to wash knives around the kitchen as you use them. I'm really terrible at this when I cook. I like this just an absolute bombsite after every time I do it. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, it might be to, you know, test run that uh, new dish with one of the regulars. That might be your thing that you're going to try and do to make sure that you can continue and make your, your restaurant a really landmark fun. So... And I think you should talk through these like, purple ones. I think you've, you're much better at them. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So the bit I was we were going to talk about um, here was, um, firstly, there is a, in this webinar series, there is a video that we did with Matthew Skelton um, around productivity and flow, especially around the sort of mitigation that we might be thinking for leaders and managers. Um, so... There's a, there's a range of activities that we would do to, to optimize for these areas, but also there's a fundamental mindset shift. So Billy talked a little bit about Taylorism and really the role of managers and leaders to be coordinating, to spend their time dishing out work or uh, holding meetings, um, ensuring that people are all doing the right thing. And there's a mindset there that then they become um, obsessed with finding flow and finding blockers to flow that they can remove. Um, so in the simplification process for leaders, this could be continuously untangling business concepts. There's a role of coordination that leaders and managers find themselves doing because the business is so complicated and it's so intertwined and there's so many edge cases and there's so much history that it comes very difficult for teams to represent that value to customers quickly in a way that is finding flow and delivering value continuously. So instead of it being a coordination role you're thinking right how can i untangle this complexity so that my teams can deliver against it as opposed to it is my role to explain the complexity and to continuously can coordinate our teams around the complexity because they couldn't possibly understand it so i need to understand it and tell people what to do um so i think i'm struggling to see your thing because i'm slightly blind so, sorry about uh, that. I will zoom. Yeah, and then so that's also going to be things like identifying value streams um, for a team that is um, for a team or for maybe a team that's delivering a software or a software uh, enhanced solution. That's going to be things like uh, good training and good choice of technology, um, hiring the right people, hiring for things like aptitude instead of specific skills, or maybe the ways of working, which is a pair programming where. You know, people can effectively learn and upskill people incredibly quickly. Um, in terms of the minimize, um, it could be that we're going to um, coordinate with the other teams. It could be we shift quality gates left instead of having to coordinate a change um, advisory board at the very last step. How can we enable the teams to understand the risks, the concerns that the business has around safety and security so that that work is built in can be solved by the team and isn't a managerial leadership role that has to be completed right at the end of the process. Um, and for teams, it's often these really boring or superfluous tasks that can be automated. Really classic examples are either the team automating their deployment process so they don't really have to worry about how they get their valuable bit of business logic code out to customers that is automated. Or it could be that um, in collaboration with the leaders and managers, you're creating teams that can do that role for lots of teams. So that's where you get the platform as a product sort of role. Um, and in terms of the maximize, as leaders and managers, we want to be thinking more, how can we spend more time listening? How can we listen to our teams, to our organization? 
How can we listen to what our customers want? How can we listen to um, what the technology future looks like so that we are not being surprised by any of those things and having to do really urgent reworking of how everything works, how the teams work, what the business does, those sorts of things. So a real focus on as leaders, what is the strategy? How do we meet our customers' needs as opposed to coordinating the delivery of that work? Um, and for, for, for teams themselves or people delivering the actual work, they could be, um, how do we get that core business logic out? How do we understand the real differentiating bit of software that will set us apart from our, um, from our competition? Um, and how do we spend our time coming up with a really fantastic solution for that that's going to make our customers happy instead of, well, we get to think about that on Tuesday mornings for one hour in our innovation meeting, and we spend the rest of the time working, learning new tools we don't understand or working out how to get um, get our change through 14 committees on the way to production. I always find a really telling thing for, for teams in particular is, can they articulate who their customer is and can they tell me something about their customer, like what their favourite sport is or, or like what their name is or, you know, anything like that? Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that I find really important when I make, <laughs> when we make something is to to, like, validate it with actual customers. So uh, what we did here was... Um, before, before obviously uh, doing this, we run this in a sum form for a, a few different times, but uh, in this specific like fancy form with all the gerbils and things, uh, we did a little bit of test run. So what you're seeing here is real answers from uh, real people who were sitting down to think about this as an exercise and who are sitting down to think about this to improve their workflow. So um, if I were to tell you the person that did this, uh, you would recognize the name of the company and uh, you'd be like, Ooh, that's really cool. But I did say to keep this anonymous. So, uh, but thank you so much for, 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 for trying these out with me. So what I want you to see from this is like, what we're starting to do here is when we start running on tasks, we're starting at quite a high level. So we've got this like uh, the, the, key part of this role is to uh, keep the team of 150 people working as uh, effectively as possible. And when we first started writing down task lists, these started off quite high level. So we were like meetings, reporting, one-to-ones. So, And then we started getting more and more specific as time went on, as we started discussing more and more things. And I, I want you to look out for this. Don't be afraid of making a like a ticket which represents something which is a bit more detailed if you can't if you don't feel quite ready to break down the this into its constituent parts yet you can go through and you can add that in and you can make sure that that's going to be in there uh so next up we sorted these i'm going to zoom in a bit uh we sorted these into their different categories and I want to just draw your attention here to uh, like something which is really interesting. Now, I mentioned before that for different people, different parts of the like for different roles and different organizations, different things are going to show up as being intrinsic or extraneous or germane because the roles are different. The environment is different. Um, so in this case, we considered uh, one to ones reporting meetings to be part of the base effort. However, for you, you might discover that actually, like, this isn't really adding much value to your primary purpose. So maybe they, for you, they would be an extraneous or perhaps uh, if you were, I don't know, working in an organization that develops fantastic meetings, then perhaps they would be in germane. So don't be afraid of, like, having a discussion around these, talking to your peers about it. Like, if you can do it by yourself, then, like, try and be a bit sophistry about it, like, balance it off yourself. Um, but if you're in a team, like listen to those discussions, draw out the value there, uh, listen to the differing opinions because you're uncovering differences in mental models, which are really important as like from an alignment perspective. Okay. And once we did this, we came down and we we came up with some ideas for how we might do this. So uh, for example, like we, we decided that we were gonna block out some uh, time for strategy. Uh, we're going to decide we're going to like try and uh, attend industry events. These are all the super valuable germane things. We're going to try and do a bit less because we've got less people on our team. And we're going to try and like talk to customers and, and juice their brain for like what they know and what they need and the, the holes they need drilled in the wall that are going to cause them to buy a drill. Um, 
And like from the minimize, we're going to like prevent ourselves from uh, reduce the things which we're going to do to make sure that we have enough time to do the rest of the things. So maybe we're going to be a bit more logistical about where uh, tactical about when we plan training. We're going to be a bit. Maybe we're going to do some documentation, which means that we don't get interrupted as much. So it's easier for us to think about strategy, to think about like the amount of time and things that we have available. Okay, so now I, I would suspect that if you are technical, uh, if this, if you are uh, technical, I, I suspect that right now you are probably uh, like thinking, mm, yeah, but this sounds a bit managery. So how does this apply applied on the team level? So uh, I uh, went and grabbed one of the people that I work with every day. This awesome guy called Ben Nagy, uh, and. Uh, we, we put this together for what he does on a day-to-day -day basis when he's working with the client. So um, if we have things in the task, which are like doing personal learning, writing code, doing certifications, like having one-to-ones with people, pair programming. So these are all like really like technical nitty gritty detail type things. And then once we've done this, we sorted them into the different categories. And so like we have the base effort, like writing code, making sure that you can design architectural systems effectively. Uh, and maybe the extraneous, like responding to help in coding, managing backlogs, PRs, standups. Uh, and maybe the domain, which is all about like growing, doing certifications, understanding the customer. And finally, at the bottom, we came up with some uh, like ideas as to how we might, might improve things. So, uh, for the context of a, um, a system where you're using pull requests, the, one of the things that you might minimize might be to, as we kind of mentioned before, like move to continuous delivery. Like anything that a human does, mm, <laughs> I'm going to roll back on that statement, uh, that a lot of things that uh, you do in a, a CD PR pipeline, then you can uh, probably automate. So you can reduce the amount of cognitive load you need to hold in your mind in order to do that. Um, if you're going to design, like if you go on a course and learn about architectural design, it's going to be easier to design architectures, right? So that might be a good example of something that we can do for simplifying something. Um, and like the and maximizing, like making sure that you're having one-to-ones with high interest, high influence people. So you can really understand what the customer's problems are. So you can name them. So you can do all that kind of cool things. Uh, so... Ben, is there anything else that we should hold in mind, hold bear in mind as for for these? Um, I don't think so. I think we're doing all right for time. I think um, we've got a slide at the end with a bit of a summary, and then we can. Um, there's a few questions that have come in. Um, we can look to answer those, and then we can get Excellent. people on their way with time for a drink before their next meeting, which is the dream of all webinars, right? That is that is the <laughs> golden outcome. Okay, so uh, like, so what we're going to do is we'll, we'll give you this template uh, at the end of this, and we'll make sure that you can like, run this team. Like, it seems a little bit intimidating, but like, you could go as high fi or as low fi as you want with this. So like, you could use this template off here, or you could like riff on it and do something yourself. Uh, I, I will judge you if you don't include uh, guinea pigs, though. <laughs> but yeah, so. Um, we're gonna we're gonna help you if you can do this but so what's the point of all this like how, how does this how does this work like where does this fit into like a, a workflow or what's the point so this is really a summary of, of really what we've everything that we've talked about so we've talked about um obviously cognitive load we've talked about that ability just to understand it to be able to categorize it and then to be able to optimize it based on identifying, discussing, having those conversations. As Billy said, the conversations are often the most revealing bit. It isn't really about getting everything in the right bucket and it being um, absolutely correct all the time. Really those discussions and then thinking about how do we mitigate it um, is a really key part of what we talked about. And we feel like if we can do that, if we can optimize our cognitive load, A, in terms of um, our individual experience, the burnout of ourselves, of our teams, of our leaders. I'm sure you can burn out a whole business um, or a whole organization. 
And also just that bog down bit. How can we use that to get the flow of value from the customer need, customers asking for a thing, consumers, um, in and really we've worked with this sort of concept in in any of the verticals. We've talked to people in healthcare or it could be financial services, wherever. So that idea of, right, hang on, we, we're going to use this lens to get flow. And then as leaders and managers, we're thinking, how can I do it? You know, there's the sense of putting your own mask on um, to save yourself first, because if you are well optimized in terms of the time that you have to work, then that is that is important. And then as a manager and leader, how can you get a visibility of your landscape? How can you start to untangle those business um, really complex business um, models. Um, how can you start to identify flow? How can you start to see where there are blockers in that flow? Um, and we've got some tools that we talked about in the talk, but things like value stream mapping, where as a team you can understand how you actually do your work, how you get value to your to your customers, um, and then that really just gives you a mechanic using the data and the process to show you what is. Um, the key constraint, the key blockers that you need to remove, and then you're looking at how do I um, how do I solve those? Um, and it could be things like core domain mapping, which is how do I understand what the really key differentiators are for um, for our business for, for the customers that we are trying to serve, and what is the stuff that we really that is undifferentiated heavy lifting that we could best be doing elsewhere. And that's a really important perspective from a cognitive load perspective because we really want to be focusing on that top right hand on the core domain map. We want to be understanding what is the key differentiators and be reducing, simplifying the amount of time that we are spending on things that aren't. That is that undifferentiated heavy lifting. So there's those tools that um, we have for leaders to understand their landscape, to allow alignment and understanding with their teams. And then we drop down into the, the teams of teams level, and we're really taking exactly the same process, the same mindset, um, but maybe we've just got a different set of tools. Um, it could be that we are looking at running this cognitive load exercise. It could be that we are um, we do a technology radar. We want to understand what type of tools we are selecting. Have other teams around us stopped using a particular tool because it was causing all sorts of cognitive load problems. It was hard to learn. It was hard to deploy. It was hard to maintain. It isn't a core thing that this business should be doing. And learning from each other um, about how to optimize those sorts of things is really key. Um, it could be that a, a day one commit drill is useful. That's the approach where you try and have a new person join the team. And can they commit value all the way through to production on day one within that first day? And that's obviously a, an assessment of all the different areas of cognitive load. It's uh, what's the environment like? How easy is it to understand? How easy is it to understand the value of this team? What their mission is? How do I focus my time on identifying a one tiny bit of core germane business value and get it all the way to a customer? And if you can do that as a team, then it's fantastic. You're probably in a very good place. You've probably already have thought about and balanced all the things that we've talked about in terms of um, doing the actual work, the environment which we do the work on, and allowing our teams and our teams of teams to focus on um, what's really important. Um, so we just go through this cycle. So, and there's a there's a mindset shift in here. There's a mindset shift. There is a new prism to view all of this stuff through, um, and that's the real ask. There's a tool that we're offering to do, but there is also a sense that um, there is a mindset shift. So I think we've running out of time. We've maybe got five minutes left. Um, thank you to everyone that came. We've got some questions. We'll, I haven't quite looked them yet, but we'll hopefully answer a few of those for the last minutes. Um, there is the video of the talk that we did at FastFlowConf, and FastFlowConf also has a whole slew of other fantastic videos on around this topic and around team topologies. Um, the session that we did today, this bit of workshop, is really um, one of the small focuses of um, a set of team topologies one-day workshops that we do, where we explore this whole field in a lot more in a lot more detail. Um, so we're a, um, a learning partner for team topologies, um, and we have access to those fantastic one-day back of the classroom, really experiential learning experiences that focus on this and how this fits in all the other concerns that we as leaders have. Um, 
there's a QR code there, scan it. There's um, a feedback form. Me and Billy love to learn. We love um, negative constructive feedback. Um, so really let us um, know what you would have preferred. And um, there's a link to all the materials that we've talked about through this talk and through the previous talk. Um, so thank you very much. I don't know, Billy, if you managed to have a quick look at the questions. Um, yeah. Um, should uh, how, how do we want to do this? So I read them out, read one out, and then we answer it? If there's one that you can see that you would like to answer, then maybe if you could do that. And as I said, we'll answer all of these questions and we'll publish them out to people along with the video of this talk so you can share it with other people too. Yeah, so uh, I, there's one here which I just want to just want to talk about, which is um, I thought uh, psychological safety was the foundation of high performing teams. Is this more or less important? So uh, psychological safety is definitely the uh, core of a high functioning team, and without psychological safety, you can uh, you probably aren't going to be able to deliver in a speedy thing because. Psychological safety leads into the extraneous. So if you're feeling unpsychologically safe, that is essentially extraneous cognitive load, which is going to be piling on to your um, the things that you're doing on a on a day to day basis and expanding that pink, that uh, extraneous area, which is going to obviously push out the germane. So psychological safety is very important, uh, and if you don't think about it at all, then you're going to uh, you're probably going to fall into fall into a little bit of a trap there. Um, but yeah, uh, that, that was a. Uh, was there any questions in particular that you spotted Ben that you went to? Um, there's one here, which is how do I measure the value of this? I can see lines of code or features shipped. I'm going to struggle to get my stakeholders to buy into this. Um, I think there's. It feels like there's a there's a technical flow answer to this, and there's also a very human answer. Um, I think things like value stream mapping are going to allow you to show the amount of time, the amount of effort that it takes to deliver value to a customer. And it gives you data along the way. Um, and short shortening those value streams, increasing the or increasing the flow of value through them is often demonstrable. You can often see the, the reduced cost of delay of um, optimizing that. Um, so you've got tools which generate data and allow data-driven decision-making as opposed to purely just having to convince people, I reckon this would be a great thing to try. There is elements of this which we can use to build those data-driven um, business cases. Um, and also, uh, lots of organizations that we see, there are people who are on long-term sick. There are people, people are seeing um, higher than usual amounts of sickness, people taking days off, and it often you know just the, the turnover of staff in organizations um is much higher so there's a real human cost to that there's obviously a real business cost the cost of acquiring keeping upskilling new people is a lot lot higher than people think it is i certainly know that as a business owner i certainly know it as a as someone that works with lots of large complex organizations so i think in all there's data to be taken from this and why this sort of stuff can be important and the impact that it can have. Um, how are we doing? I think we're. I think we're out of time. Unless there's one more that you were burning to that you'd seen, Billy. Uh, I'm good. I, I I really want to answer them, but I want to give them really good answers. So. Uh... Okay, great. So we uh, we take this video, we publish it onto YouTube, we will put it on a page on our website. We will add into it all these uh, questions and answers, uh, and we will let you know. Uh, where that is by the email that you signed up to this webinar. But otherwise, we are one minute over, which means you've only got 40 minutes to prepare coffee and beverages and drinks um, and optimise your cognitive load before the next meeting, which I assume is at 10. Treat yourself to a biscuit. You deserve it. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for staying to the end. Um, it was really great. Right.